Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu In this video inshallah I'd just like to give um, a bit of an explanation um, around one of the difficulties in approaching the Arabic language you know, one of the difficulties that a lot of my students and their parents bring to me um, just to offer an explanation of what that problem is and maybe some solutions for it inshallah so you know when people approach learning the Arabic language they usually come to it in one of two, from one of two directions. They're either coming from a language learning perspective, maybe they've learned other languages in the past and they're interested in languages and then they come to Arabic. Or they are in a, a seeking knowledge perspective. You know, they want knowledge of the Quran, knowledge of the Hadith, and generally to become among the tulab al-ilm, among the students of knowledge. And of course the Arabic language is one of the sciences for a student of Islamic knowledge to seek. And, you know, both of them have their you know, both of them have their issues, but when we come to the Arabic language, if you come to the Arabic language from the direction of a language learner, one of the big criticisms that I have of, like, of secular curriculums of the Arabic language is often it's, it's, an, it's an injustice, really, to treat the Arabic language the way other languages are treated. And, and the reason for this is that the Arabic language is really unique in that some of the most basic things that you might try to teach your children, you know, like a lot of parents come to me, if especially when I've taught very small children, children who are as young as like three and four I've taught in the past, and the parents say, I'll just start off with some of these simple topics. And the thing about the Arabic language is, some of the topics which we perceive to be really simple, or some of the topics which are really simple in other languages, are the most grammatically complex in the whole language. Sometimes, you know, so, so I wanted to offer some examples of what I mean by this, so... In Arabic, you know, or, or, or in any other language, language really, if you're teaching your children, you might start with some vocab lists like learning the colours or learning the numbers in, in that language. The thing is, is, is the numbers and the colours in Arabic are some of the most, you know, as I say, grammatically complex topics there are in the Arabic language. And just to demonstrate to you, I mean, you know, in another language, if you're learning Spanish or French or Somali or Urdu or whatever, like... Really, it's, a, it's, it's as easy as learning a vocab list, right? It's as easy as just having, like, something that's orange and then saying the colour orange. But in the Arabic language, there's a really, really vast amount of grammar that goes into these seemingly simple concepts. So, just to kind of run you through what I mean, and one of the things that Arabic teachers have to deal with when parents say, well, what, what, why haven't, you know, my, my children have been learning Arabic with you for, you know, six months and they don't know the colours, or they don't know how to use the numbers, but... You know, so for example, with the colours, if we start off with that, the colours in the Arabic language, not only do they have masculine and feminine, so for example, if we have the colour ahmaru, ahmar, meaning the colour red, we also have the feminine, ahmra. So we have a masculine and we have a feminine. These words also come into a group of Arabic words known as mamnu' min al-sarf. Um, you know, there's not really an English translation of that, but what it really means is they're in a group of words that will never take tenween. So they're not just normal nouns or normal adjectives. It's not a normal ism. None of the colours are a normal ism in the Arabic language. They, first and foremost, they are they have both genders. They are mam norman as sarf. But not only that, there's a whole form of Arabic verbs, which is the form nine. Um, Afal would be the would be the pattern. So ahmarra is a verb to to become red. So there's a whole category of verbs for changing to become that colour or being that colour. And then there's, you know, there's complicated, just foundational grammar, really. Like, it, it wouldn't be appropriate in early lesson, in, a, in, a, in a early in an Arabic language curriculum, and, and this is true for my curriculum as well, that you wouldn't be able to say something like, the house is red. You know, because normally when you'd have that sentence, there's some very simple rules for, you know, creating simple sentences like that in Arabic. But to, to encounter the colours that don't, that don't, that they don't comply with those, with those rules is is really difficult. So not only are the colours really, really complicated grammatically, but the numbers are, you know, the, the numbers are are talked about among the, the de definitely secular circles of learning the Arabic language, like at universities or, you know, in the GCSE or the A-level curriculums, that the numbers are perhaps more complicated, you know, because each group of the numbers have different grammatical rules. So, for example, the number one is just treated like an adjective. You'd say, Baytun wahidun, one house. But then with the number two, because you have this thing called the dual in Arabic, you don't really use the number ithnain very much. Or ithnan, or ithnatain, or ithnain. That's another confusion, okay? The, 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 the word, 
the the word the word of the number two has has case and stuff as well. And then the numbers between three and ten, they take the plural and they are majrur. Yeah, so you'd say, um, I don't know, um, and they're reverse gender. So if the house, for example, baytun is masculine, when you say three houses, you need to use the feminine of the number. So you'd say, buyutin, three houses. So there's a whole lot of confusing grammar. We've only done the numbers one to ten at this point. And imagine me having to teach a three-year-old that. Me having to explain to a three-year-old why those are plural. And then when you get past the number ten, you never use the plural again. Yeah, like the number, if you were to, if you were to say something like, a thousand nights, you don't use the plural for the word nights. You use the singular. You, you know, many of you know, El Fulayla, you know, is, is, is a thousand nights. And those of you who know um, Surah Al-Qadr, know that um, Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, Laylatul Qadri khayrun min alfi shahr. The, the, the night of power is better than alfi shahr. Is better than alf, a thousand. Shahr, it's just one shahr. It doesn't say alfu ashhur or alfu shuhur. It doesn't use the plural. So, you know, the Arabic language is, in its very essence, supposed to be approached as a science. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be approached differently to other differently to other, you know, other, other languages. And I'm going to do a separate video on my thoughts on the GCSE curriculum, because I've mentored a lot of students through the GCSE syllabus, and I've marked GCSE papers, and, um, you know, and I, have a, I even have a few videos on this channel about the GCSE paper and taking it, but, you know, I think there's a need for me to explain my thoughts on why I'm not teaching it anymore, because I've been inundated with requests. Maybe 10 of you have, have approached me and asked me if I'll teach your children the GCSE, and... Unfortunately, I'm the wrong person now. Like, now, now, you know, like, I have my own kind of, my own thoughts on the way that the students should approach learning the Arabic language. And, um, you know, the fact is, is that the Muslim sources, the, the traditional Islamic sources, are far more rigorous and far more detailed and far better codified than any secular attempt at, at, cod at codifying the Arabic language. Any secular attempt, any attempt in the West to try to create their own curriculums for learning the Arabic language. You know, so, so if a student is to approach learning the Arabic language and goes through an Islamic route, they will always do better. You know, they will, they will, they will always have a more comprehensive and better understanding. And, and if you were to, if a student were to go through the Medina books, for example, like they're written in the Islamic world and by, by scholars of the religion, and then they were to study things like al ajr um, al fiya Ibn Malik, like these grammar, these grammar texts, you could sit the GCSE in a couple of weeks and probably get full marks. Like, really, it would be a breeze for you if you were to just approach the Arabic language in, in the way that its earliest scholars had codified it. So that, that's really what I wanted to mention in this. You know, the, 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 the whole point of this video is just to illustrate to you that the Arabic language cannot really be, be approached well in the same way that other languages are, because some of the most basic and childlike topics that we perceive to be, to be, we perceive to be basic, are some of the most grammatically rigorous. So, so that's really the point of this video. Um, it's just some thoughts on the, on the, on the, uh, the struggle of learning the Arabic language. So please let me know in the comments what, what, what you think about that. Give me some feedback, inshallah, on what your thoughts on it and if it made sense. And, um, you know, I, lo I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.